This is the first video in the Edexcel C3 revision tutorial series. In this first episode we will be looking at quantitative and qualitative approaches as well as having a look at how we can test for different ions. First of all it is important to note what the differences are between qualitative and quantitative information. Qualitative analysis tells us what is present. For example, it will tell us any poisonous substances in drinking water, as well as any trace elements. It doesn't tell us how much of it there is, just that it is present. Quantitative analysis, on the other hand, tells us how much is present. For example, how much alcohol is present in a driver's blood, or how much of each trace element there are in a sample of water. So in this video tutorial, we will look at both qualitative and quantitative data. We will have a look at how we can test for different ions, how these different ion tests can be used by chemists in both the water industry and in blood testing. And finally, we will look over how to write balanced chemical and ionic equations using different state symbols. Analytical chemists are chemists that study the different makeups of chemicals. They could be asked to investigate the levels of salt in food products or the source of pollution in a river. For the levels of salt in a food product, they would need to use the quantitative analysis approach because they would be looking at how much salt was in the specific food products. In order to look at the source of pollution in a river, they would be able to use qualitative data in order to state exactly where the source of the pollution is believed to be. Most analytical chemistry takes place in order to test different ionic compounds. This means identifying the different ions that are present. All ionic compounds are formed of both a cation and an anion. The cation is the positively charged ion, for example the metal ion, and the anion is the negatively charged ion, for example the halogens here. In industry, chemists need to test for both these cations and the anions in order to work out exactly which compound is present. This is specifically important as many chemicals appear clear and in order to distinguish between them we need to be able to test for their components. In testing for any different ions it is important that the test should only give one positive result. Therefore, you will know which ion you have from your test. If you didn't have a unique result for each ion, there would be no point analysing the compound as all you could say is that it could be ion A or it could be ion B. It is essential, therefore, that we get a definitive result. This means that we can gradually rule out different compounds. For example, in the first set of tests, we might find out that copper 2 ions are present, and in the results of the second test, we could find out that we have chloride ions. Therefore, assuming that the substance is pure, we will have copper 2 chloride. For your exam, you need to know some common tests for both positive and negative ions. We will be looking at the metal ions first that we can identify via flame test. Most metals can be found using different flame tests. This is where a small amount of the sample is placed in a flame and the colour change of the flame is noted. Here we have the results for the five most common flame test results. We have lithium, which goes red, sodium, which burns with a yellow flame, potassium, which is lilac, calcium, which is brick red, and barium, which is green. It is important to note that copper is also a green colour, however, it is a far darker green than barium. In order to test for other metals, we can carry out a precipitate reaction. 
So what is a precipitate reaction? Well, a precipitate reaction is any reaction where two liquids mix to form a solid inside the liquid, as shown in the diagram here. So we have one clear liquid being added to a second clear liquid, producing this cloudy white precipitate. This cloudy solid is known as the precipitate as it precipitates out of solution. We need to know the colour of precipitate for a variety of metals. So, as we said, some metal compounds form these precipitates, that insoluble solid, and it is formed when sodium hydroxide is added to them. We use this sodium hydroxide as sodium is more reactive than the other metals, and therefore we will be forming this displacement reaction. Consider it with calcium chloride, so we have calcium chloride plus our sodium hydroxide here, forming our calcium hydroxide and our sodium chloride. We have our displacement reaction. We will now look at a selection of metal ions. First, we have calcium, or Ca2+, which forms a white precipitate. So we have our calcium ions, Ca2+, which are aqueous, meaning they are in solution, and we add them to our 2OH-, again in an aqueous state, to form our insoluble salt, calcium hydroxide, which is solid. This here is our ionic equation. It's an ionic equation as we are dealing exclusively with the ions. We are not interested in the second part of the metal compound, for example if it's a chloride, neither are we interested in which hydroxide this is. Next we have copper 2, which is Cu2+, which gives us a blue precipitate, with the ionic equation being the same as for calcium, however this time we have copper. Next, we have the two different iron ions. Iron 2, which is Fe2+, and iron 3, which is Fe3+. Iron 2 forms green precipitates, whereas iron 3 forms brown precipitates. This means that the ionic equation for iron 2 is the same as the ionic equation for both calcium and copper, with Fe2 plus replacing Ca2 plus. However, for iron 3, Fe3 plus, we have Fe3 plus in the aqueous state, plus 3OH minus in the aqueous state, forming FeOH3 in the solid state. You also need to know the colour of precipitates for aluminium and ammonium. Aluminium gives off a white precipitate, but it then redissolves in excess sodium hydroxide to reform a colourless solution. So we form aluminium hydroxide, which is ALOH3, which is a white coloured solid precipitate, but then it will redissolve to form aluminium hydroxide ions, which are ALOH4 minus. However, these are soluble, so the precipitate redissolves. For ammonium or NH4, there is no precipitate, but when heated, it gives off ammonia. This can be detected via its distinctive smell or via using damp red litmus paper, which the ammonia gas will turn blue. As we looked at on the previous slide, the test for the ion should be unique. However, both calcium and aluminium form this distinctive white coloured precipitate. However, as we also looked at, when you have excess sodium hydroxide present, the aluminium hydroxide ions will redissolve and therefore will return to being a colourless solution. The precipitate will dissolve. This means that we can test if we have calcium ions or if we have aluminium ions. However, we do not only need to test for metal ions, we also need to be able to test for the anions as well.
We have already looked at the ammonium ions, the NH4+, these are cations. However, we also need to be aware of the test for the halides, which are chloride, bromide and iodide. In order to test for these, we add a few drops of dilute nitric acid in order to react with any other chemicals, followed by a few drops of silver nitrate solution. If we have chloride ions present, then we form a white precipitate. Bromide ions will go a pale yellow or cream colour. And finally, the iodide ions will form a dark yellow precipitate. This is because we are making silver chloride, silver bromide and silver iodide. If you remember back to C2, you will have already looked at the test for halides. You also need to look back over the test for carbonates using dilute acid, which will cause the carbonates to effervesce or fizz, giving off carbon dioxide, which can be tested for using lime water. And sulfates can be tested for using a mixture of hydrochloric acid and barium chloride. As a reminder, here is our test for carbonate ions. So we have our carbonate in our acid here, which gives off our carbon dioxide, which can be bubbled through lime water, which will go cloudy. So we have our calcium carbonate plus our hydrochloric acid going to calcium chloride, carbon dioxide and water. We can test for the carbonate via looking at the carbon dioxide. Also, for our sulfate ions, we can add a few drops of hydrochloric acid, followed by a few drops of our barium chloride, and we will form a white precipitate of barium sulfate, if sulfate ions are formed. So we have our barium chloride solution plus our sodium sulfate solution, giving us sodium chloride, which is a colourless aqueous solution, and our solid barium sulfate, which is our white precipitate we can see here. A question taken directly from the C3 examinations may look something like this. So we have a technician who has found some colourless crystals of a substance left. They are unlabeled. We know that it could either be potassium sulfate, potassium iodide, sodium sulfate or sodium iodide. Explain how, using chemical tests, we could find out which of these solutions it could be. It's important to note that all four of these solutions are colourless solutions. So, first of all, we have the test for the cation. This can be done via a flame test. If the flame is yellow or not lilac, then we have sodium ions. However, if it is lilac and therefore not yellow, we have potassium ions. We then need to determine whether we have iodide or whether we have sulfate. In order to test for iodide, we make a solution, add our dilute nitric acid and then our silver nitrate. And if we have the yellow precipitate, we have the iodide ions. If there is no precipitate, then therefore we must have sulfate ions. We have our ionic equation here. In this question, you only have to describe how you would test to ensure that it is either iodide or sulphate, and therefore you do not need to describe both. However, we also have the test for sulphate ions here, which would enable us to see if it was sulphate and therefore not iodide. This concludes the first video tutorial in the Edexcel C3 revision tutorial series. In the next episode, C3.2, we will be looking at hard water and how this is caused and how we can remove it.